the Lord. And um, this is how the Lord has given to our family. Uh, we are going to continue to be very rich in the word of God. Um, and so I, I, I take extraordinary measures to try and make sure whatever that we are learning can be presented you know, as fully as possible. And that's why you see all those, uh, 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 what do you call the PowerPoints and uh, then the captions. Uh, and some of you, I know that you, you spend a lot of time going over the messages. And so that's a good uh, point of reference for you uh, because what we're really learning is very serious um, understanding, seriously engaging with the word of God. And so that's our great commission. That's the very purpose of why we are here at this point in time. So because we are being trained and groomed to think like God, think his laws, to be a judge and a lawgiver. And today, uh, our meditation will also, again, bring us front and center to this. All right. So and uh, so so marvelous. Let's dive into today's message, which uh, comes in from the angle in which we seldom think like this, and society doesn't, right? But we are actually coming uh, through. Oh, sorry, I did not share the screen yet. Let me share the screen, and uh, we will. Because today we are thinking about women and the law and inheritance. All right, and it's still a part of. Uh, you can say lingering in First Corinth, First Chronicles, chapter two. Um, because the Lord wants to detain us in this region of the genealogy where his people and the land are married to each other. And even the daughters give birth. You know, the daughters of Zelophehad, had three of them give birth to names of three cities, even in that general territory in Gilead. So it's kind of fascinating uh, when we begin to uh, think God's purposes even into our lives thousands of years later, right? Thousands of years later, what has the daughters or what do the daughters of Zelophehad, a dead father who had no sons, got to do with us? And so we trust in, in God and Lord Jesus, we want to honor you and in each one of your children and even in these daughters of does love ahead, we will see uh, the daughters of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Jerusalem that is birthed, even in our midst. And, and even from these daughters, the sons also learn, because we are both daughters and sons, really children of the kingdom. Now, most people think of the daughters of the love ahead, these five daughters, all right, who ask for an inheritance a lot of land only within the historical setting that they pave the way for uh, for women's right, women's right of expression, rights of possession, which is OK, which is good. Very, very powerful. These young girls, perhaps very, very young. Uh, but they are also presenting us different spiritual pictures. And today we are going to learn uh, through the lenses of uh, three uh, common spiritual uh, understanding that we bring to a text, all right? So there are three spiritual senses in biblical texts. That's one of the uh, very powerful ways of reading the Bible, is you're reading it for its spiritual meaning. But then the spiritual meaning, you can see it from three different pathways or senses, all right? So, for example, you can sample your food by the use of... Uh, uh, ground pepper and then another way by by using salt and another way by using lemon all right so so there are three distinct spiritual tastes or senses in which we can approach our study of uh, these five daughters of Zelophehad. now in a very broad you can say allegorical uh, sim symbolically parallel fashion. Uh, you can look at these five daughters as being 
spoken of as the five virgin daughters in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. So ten of them waiting for the bridegroom and the bride to show up for the finest feast, the final feast of that marriage. And they all fell asleep, but however, at midnight, the cry rang out, here comes the bridegroom, and there are some other, there's a text called the Bel Shem Tov, uh, the, the Shem Tov Matthew. It says, waiting for the bridegroom and the bride. The bridegroom and the bride, they are here. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lambs, but the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lambs are going out. No oil to burn on. But these wise virgins said, no, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. That's very wise counsel here from the Lord Jesus through the lips of these five wise virgins. In other words, you've got to be the one who are well prepared to come into inheriting the bride and the bridegroom, to be inheriting that the wedding of all weddings, to come into uh, the, the household of celebrating the marriage between heaven and earth. So these are very powerful lessons that the Lord Jesus wants his disciples to understand. Very, very, uh, take it very deep into us. So as we approach the daughters of the Lafayette, we can also keep in mind the wise virgins who did the work necessary to position, position, the, position themselves so that they, they will not miss out on their inheriting the bride and the bridegroom and the bridal uh, celebration. Okay, we, our kind of focus will be on covenant faithfulness and covenant succession. So you're successfully receiving into your life the covenant, all right? And from generation to generation, or from your own generation, in other words, your name lives on, or the name of your father. And in this case, the name of our father is Yahweh, which is the name Jesus. He lives on in us because we have now truly come to inherit him. So now, but as I mentioned earlier, we are going to uh, be exploring this territory, Gilead and the Bashan and this region where the 12 tribes first come into the land across from the river Jordan or in and around that region. And because we, we see that some of the early uh, Israelites who came there, including some of these daughters, three of these daughters, they gave their names. The eponym means that a name that gives birth to, say, a city or an important place or a, an in, in important monument. So, so these eponymous ancestors, all right? So we are going to uh, look at some of them. And uh, later on, we're going to look at a few others, uh, some men and perhaps um, uh, another woman. We will see as the Lord leads us. But we want to be more familiar with this whole region uh, of Gilead, who is both a man and a city and a regent as well. Uh, but we want to meet uh, the Lofahed's daughters, who are the great-grandchildren of the ancestral father Gilead. And then we're going to look at it through the lens of allegory, how they dis display a persisting, a faith that would not give up, never give up. I need to reach out and take a hold of what is promised to us in our family, through our Father, in the covenant of God. Secondly, we want to uh, look at it from the moral sense. The moral sense, the spiritual meaning is to seek the right action seek justice, seek, you know, acts of justice, right? And that's a very big topic because uh, it points out to the fact that Scripture mandates righteousness. All of Scripture requires that we live out righteousness. 
So that's the moral sense. In the allegorical sense, all of scripture point to Christ. So the Old Testament, uh, there are so many, many incidents and episodes and characters, but somehow we can find a spiritual meaning of their lives, their experiences in the life of Christ. All right, so that's the allegorical sense. And then the anagogical sense, the anagogue, uh, which is less known by most, and some of you listening uh, to to this message, you will hear for the first time this word anagogue, anagogical. All right, so uh, really what, what it means is uh, forcing us to think spiritually, but eternally, spiritually, eternally. It means there's a final uh, destination that is of lasting, everlasting importance. So scripture carries an eternal significance. So every word of the Lord carries a counsel that will accrue to uh, to an endless right an endless eternity. So that's how powerful that is. Okay, let's go first to uh, look briefly at Gilead. So we are in First Chronicles two. Really, we are being detained there by. I would say the spirit of the Lord. He wants us not to just read through first nine chapters of first Chronicles, but even in chapter two, we have stayed here for, I don't know, over 10 meditations because of the important uh, sons and daughters of God that the Lord wants us to take note of. And today we are looking at Gilead. And so really, uh, Gilead shows up in first Chronicles in first Chronicles 2, and in the three verses here, chapter 21, 22, 23. So later Hezron, when he was 60 years old, married the daughter of Machir, the father of Gilead. He made love to her and she bore him Sigub. Sigub was the father of Jair, who controlled 23 towns in Gilead. But Gesher and Aram captured Havav Jair, as well as Kenath with the surrounding settlements, 60 towns. All these were descendants of Machia, the father of Gilead. So, so Gilead, even in these three uh, verses, uh, carries the name of a, a son and a father, right? And, uh, and also it's associated to towns that are being uh, controlled and, uh, you know, and also, you know, of descendants who are coming after that. All right, so we're going to go uh, down this line to look at that, these great granddaughters of Gilead. And so our main passage, and we, we will go to Numbers 27 and then uh, Numbers 36 and Joshua 17, the three principal passages that, narrate for us, that describe for us now these five remarkable daughters, great daughters of Gilead. So we read from Numbers 27, verse 1, and we are going to see here in these two verses how to understand this passage uh, through the allegorical sense. Now, sometimes the allegory uh, is compared to the parable uh, form, which is quite close, all right? So, um, or sometimes compared to the use of metaphors, yeah? Because you are, you're representing something for something else. Oh, this is my bread and butter. So I'm speaking allegorically of my vocation. Maybe I'm a carpenter. Maybe I'm really a baker. <laughs> Maybe I sell, uh, you know, in the bakery section, foods. At Safeway, right? So, um, but when you say this is my bread and butter, means that this is what I do to make a living. All right. So, so that's an idea of a, uh, of metaphor. So an allegory is much larger, a string of metaphors, and an allegorical sense is means looking at it uh, through figurative, metaphoric language. Right. So. Uh, Okay, so let's read from Numbers chapter 27. The daughters of Zelophehad, son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, of the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. These five daughters, 
Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, Tertza, they came forward before Moses, Eliezer, the priest, the leaders, and the whole community, whole assembly, at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So, first we are given their literal ancestry. That means their actual genealogical lineage, right? Their ancestral line. So, but if we are trying to see that all scriptures point to Christ in this allegorical sense, we can look at, okay, the daughters of Zelophehad. So what does the name Zelophehad symbolize? What? So there are two possible uh, uh, meaning for Zelophehad, depending on which Hebrew words you want to trace out the stem. The first is means the first rupture, the first one that came out of the womb. You can say the firstborn. Right, so the love for her can, can be a picture of the, the first child who is born out of the, a mother's womb and who has the, the, the real inheritance, the double portion inheritance. That's the firstborn. Now, on the other hand, the love for her, if you build it out of two other uh, Hebrew uh, stems, it means shadow of fear. So you can say that every firstborn comes out and it's already under the shadow of fear that you know, you are in kind of a bondage. Now, we are told uh, by Paul, right? So in Christ, right, he has come to bring us out of the bondage or the fear of the world systems uh, to be joined to God the Father as sons with an inheritance. So this bondage and fear and the firstborn son or the firstborn son losing their inheritance, and we see that in the case of uh, uh, Reuben, the firstborn son, right, uh, who slept with his father's concubine and so lost his firstborn uh, right, or Esau lost his firstborn right. So you can even see here the daughters of Zelophehad who were born out of this firstborn son who lived in the shadow of fear, all right, so... Um, they are brought into common humanity, the common struggles of that reality. So they are children of the firstborn uh, son who live in the shadow of fear. So, so they are uh, they carry that. But interestingly, look at that. The daughters of the love of had, or the the one who is firstborn who live under the shadow of fear, is the son of Hepha, or son of the pit. Someone who is in the pit. And who is the son of someone who is called the rock, and the son of Machir, which meanings means sold, and the son of Manasseh, which means causing to be forgotten, right? So, and of Joseph, who is the beloved of the Lord, right? So you can see through this allegorical sense, right? Thinking of it spiritually in an allegorical manner, you can say that this is a picture of a journey of those of us who who now come into Christ. All right, we we are we are now called into this family of the great firstborn son, Jesus, and uh, who shares our humanity and who shares our bondage in this world in that sense. And we find ourselves like Joseph thrown, thrown into the pit, son of Hefer. And then we are in a rocky place, but we have to come to the rock who is Christ, right? But then we are sold, right, son of Machir, sold into Egypt. And then we are forgotten like Joseph, forgotten <laughs> in the, the prison of the uh, palace, captain of the palace guard. So we can see even uh, in an allegorical sense, the, the ancestry line of the Lofahat tells us the story of his family back to the ancestral father, Joseph. Very powerful. But then what about these great children, these five daughters? Look at their name. Mala means sickly or pleading. Right, two possible meaning. Noah means rest, at rest. Or on the other hand, it also means staggering about, not at rest, rocking about. And what about hogla? Hogla means hobble or hop about like a, a partridge, like a bird, right? It's supposed to be flying, but it's hobbling about, learning how to fly, perhaps. 
But then Milka means queen or the one with the sweetest of counsel. The king's ears turned to his most beloved queen, right, counsel. And then Terza means bringing delight because she's so pleasant. So you can even string it up again in the names and think of it prophetically. Like we start off life as sinners, we are sickly and we are pleading, asking God for help. And then the word of God comes in, we get some rest. But even when we have the word of God come into us, the word of God troubles us too, because there are all kinds of commands that show us uh, uh, that we we need to love God more or you know, we, we need to grow up. And so we are kind of, and then we are stumbling around like the partridge, like a little bit learning how to fly, hobbling around. Uh, but then when we really put on wings, we can soar like the eagle, then we become a queen. We, we rule the skies and we have good counsel. The word of God fills us. We have good counsel and we come into the place in the real royal family. And then we are the beautiful the bride that will bring Tetsa delight pleasantness to the king, right? The king of all, the king of the heavens. Now, remember, all these uh, through the allegorical sense are just what we call meaningful uh, ideas or thoughts to strengthen us, to build us up. So they should not, the allegorical sense should not uh, become carved into stone like doctrines, right? <laughs> Dogmas. They are just what we call lessons to help us learn, just like Aesop's fable, all right, or the tortoise and the, the hare, all right? So it tells a part of our spiritual journey uh, allegorically. So the, the hare or the rabbit just burst out running, but then he took too many bricks. But the the hare or the tur oh, sorry, the turtle or the tortoise it just goes slowly but never stops and he wins the race. So that's just one uh, slice of a lesson spiritually. So don't, don't make it into grand monuments of uh, church doctrine. And the problem with some of our, a lot of our church teaching is many things that are supposed to be understood allegorically and that are useful allegorically move on into the realm of uh, doctrines. One of the common ones is uh, Lazarus and the rich man, because the King James says the rich man went to he hell, which he did not. He went to Sheol, Hades, the place of the dead. You know, a whole doctrine on hell is built out of Luke 16, totally destroying scriptures, right? So there's a danger in allegorical reading if we don't understand how it's only helping us to strengthen our understanding of the ways of righteousness and love and kindness and mercy, right? So now we have looked at their literal ancestry and their prophetic names and seeing them as an allegorical picture of the journey of life for every one of us born into humanity and especially born into the household of God and it involves going out of bondage and all the way into total freedom in which we can bring delight even to the king of kings the lord of lords now we want to see them in their persisting faith a faith a belief in them of promises within their covenant family that they they're willing to push forward to it. And so they came before the most powerful leaders and elders in Israel. These five little girls, five probably teenage girls, or maybe young adulthood, apparently they're not married yet. They are definitely not married yet. And in those days, they get married very young, right? So they're not married yet. We can read it contextually, looking at the three principal passages. So they came so boldly to Moses, Eliezer, the priest, the leaders, and the whole assembly. You know, if you don't dare to go and come to someone with real authority, you're missing out, right? So yeah, uh, sometimes once in a while, and one a disciple of mine uh, would 
want to introduce another person who, who wanted to learn more about something, but they are afraid to come to me, right? So they had to summon the courage to, to make a connection with me, right? Because they don't want to take away my time and who are they? I don't know them, right? So but if they don't come, they would not get what God has prepared for them through me, right? So we need courage. So the same with each one of you, right? If you, uh, you if you are a, a living resource, right? Whether financially or resource legally, and the people who need help or who can benefit from you don't come to you, then they don't get connected. So you need boldness. And the same way we need also boldness to approach the Lord. Demand of the Lord. Demand of uh, spiritual leaders. From them, uh, the very best that you know belongs to you as well. And where did they come? They come to the entrance, at, to the at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. This is very important. Uh, they came to the most significant place, you can say, for all the community of Israel. So let me just show you this brief map, pictogram here. So the tent of the meeting is this whole big curtain area that you can say is the private residence of God. Now in Vancouver, when we first came here, we learned about standard lot sizes, 33 feet by 120 feet, feet, right? So this is a bit bigger here. Uh, so, but that's the idea, it's the marked out uh, private property of God's residence. But within the tent of the meeting, there is that tabernacle where God actually lives in there, right? His presence lives in there in the sanctuary or the holy place, and then beyond that, behind the thick curtain, the holy of holies. That's the tabernacle. So what these daughters have come to, where have come to, they've come to the tent of meeting, the, the large tent and the big entrance, and that's where all of Israel can uh, come to that place. But only a few of Israel can go within those tents, right? Within that tent into the tabernacle area where there are the bronze altar and the bronze basin of water and then the tabernacle with all uh, the uh, uh, the lampstands and the, the the showbread table and the incense uh, altar and then in the holy of holies the seat that is or the cover or the seat that is over the ark of the covenant all right okay Let's go back to here. Now, we want to see uh, today's lesson also through the pages of Hebrews. Uh, there's so many more passages we can quote our book Hebrews, but uh, the book of Hebrews give us some useful uh, commentary, you can say, on uh, what we are learning. All right, so we pick up from chapter three. So now we are looking at the allegorical sense that all scripture points to Christ and how uh, even the daughters of Zelophehad, their names and the names of each one of their ancestral fathers, uh, they can show us Christ. And so Hebrews 3, 1 tells it very beautifully. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. That the future is Christ and even the people of Christ to come, including us. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the, the hope in which we glory. These daughters of the Father have held firmly in the promise. Now, at this point, they have not actually entered in to possess it in such a, a, 
a, a way, all right? It's still to come. So this is the time before they actually come, but it's about to, this is the end of the 40 years journey in the wilderness. And these daughters are already anticipating the firmness of the promise of land inheritance that had to be given to their father, right? Because of the covenant. And that should tell us also of this, like we see, even though many of us own homes, you know, a little piece of real estate here in the greater Vancouver, in Singapore, in the US, okay, doesn't matter. These are all temporary. Even whether you're renting or you have you own the home, you're still paying. You, you, you're still paying, right? You have paid and you continue to pay, right? Uh, but there is an inheritance that is in Christ that is far better, but we have to hold on to. We have to believe. We have to contend for it. So these daughters show us how powerful that believing faith is. They believe that Yep, we still have to work our way through. Maybe we might get killed or whatever, right? We might not make it, but we are going to contend for that. We want to make sure uh, the legal, you can say, act uh, is put into place. The legal recognition is stamped uh, and they come to the highest authority. Okay, let's move on to the next way of reading spiritually, which is the next uh, two verses in Numbers 27. And here we, we're looking at the moral sense. The moral sense can be understood as trying to seek justice or the right action in every scripture, right? So when you come to the word of God and you are trying to see what is the word of God teaching me about the right action, the right attitude, the right thoughts, all right? What is just before the eyes of God, how to to seek justice, act justly. So that's what the moral sense is. So these daughters came before Moses and the leaders at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and they said, our father died in the wilderness. So that's an honest confession or a very heart-filled emotion. Their father had died, and these are five orphan daughters. And then a very bold testament. But he was not among Korah's followers who banded against, together against Yahweh. Now, a few chapters earlier in chapter 16 of Numbers and chapter 16 and 17, we see uh, Korah and the families, some of the families, right, uh, gather together and um, few hundred people came, and they came uh, to challenge the exclusive right of Moses and his family, Aaron and his boys, of ministering uh, to God in, inside his private residence, inside his tent of meetings, you can say, and in the tabernacle. So uh, they were speaking out of uh, the fact that, hey, we are just as holy as you guys, right? And they were actually challenging authority. And they, they are not happy to be uh, stationed where they are. They are already so privileged as, as a member of the community of Israel. They are already very privileged to be where they are within the camps that are encamped around the tent of meeting and uh, Yahweh's presence over all of them, right? They are, they are a special group. You know, this happens also in, in the... Uh, down the church age, even to our day. And that's why there are fights, not only between traditions, Roman Catholicism and Protestant, and then or even the Orthodox thrown into the mix, but within even local assemblies, local churches, there are fights, infighting, backbiting, gossiping, murmuring, destroying character, destroying lies, right? So these things unfortunately happen because we don't understand how to uh, look at all scriptures for righteousness, for right action, right attitude, right thoughts. And, uh, and we become like Korah, even wanting to be more holy than others, thinking that I'm holier than thou, or I know the Bible better than you, and therefore I'm superior to you. You know, all this nonsense we should put away with. If I 
who actually know the Bible better than most of you, if I think that therefore I can lord it over you and therefore I'm better, then I should, I would be worse than Korah. You know, I would be worse than that. And that's why Jesus came to teach us that, you know, if you if you are really a servant and you you enter deeper into servanthood, you you begin to serve more and more, right? And you get begin to serve everyone. So be very careful that we lose the righteous deeds or the mandates of Jesus, his instructions. We serve everyone. Pulling away from a family that God has given to you means you don't want to serve in that family, right? So that's a very, very, very clear indication that something is wrong. Unless God puts you in a, a greater part of the family where or a, a part where he wants you to fulfill that purpose, then you do that. But if you go shopping, and I'm not talking only about gem, I'm talking about all Christian churches, Christian assemblies. If you're just going shopping for yourself so that you can serve yourself more, you're, you're doing the very opposite. You're doing the Korah thing, right? Uh, so be very, be one, all right? But of course, I don't uh, negatively judge anyone who... Who, who decides to leave from one place to another. I had to leave from one church to another church too, all right? But I know, like, each time I moved, um, and I hardly moved, it was through God really taking me to do a, a work in another part of the vineyard. Other than that, you know, you stay where you are, but then you also serve. Like, I serve a lot of people outside of this jam community in the past 25 years, we are called. I serve a lot outside here, whether they are strangers or they are friends of friends or whatever. Uh, and I've taught us to do that. And many of you have done that excellently. And that's good. That's the way we are to function and continue to function, serving the body of Christ, not just local. We get very selfish, you know, local churches. We just want to take care of the, our community, whether it's uh, 10 people or 100 or 1,000 and we hardly serve the larger community, uh, which is uh, absurd because the body of Christ now is international. And so, but sometimes our tradition understanding trap us into a lot of selfishness and blindness that actually come against uh, the mandate of righteousness, do good to all men, right, everywhere. But they made a real testament a bold testament that our father, yes, he died, right, in the wilderness. And they, 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 the both testament, yes, he did die for his own sin, right? So, but it's not the sin of Korah. It's not a rebellion, right? He died for his own sin, whatever that sin, maybe lack of faith at some point in time, maybe he's just, you know, uh, Whatever it is, he belonged to those who are 20 years and over, and he did not show that faith of Caleb and Joshua. So he also died. So, yeah, that's true. But he didn't die like the way Korah and the banner people around him were judged by you. In other words, he did not lose. So, you know, some of us will struggle with various sins and imperfections in our life. Right, and we 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 know that we are weak and we are challenged, and we just don't have what is in us to overcome some of these things. But our hearts have not turned away from the Lord, and this is the case of the love ahead. That's why his daughters understood the covenant so well and their rights. And then they ask a very good question: the fourth thing, learning it through the moral sense, small spiritual sense, that you need to ask good questions. Yet, why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Because he had no son? So, at that point in time, there was no legal precedent. <laughs> there was no, you know, the, the word of the Lord is just being written out or compiled or, or taken into memory, and it is still many years yet before it's actually physically written down, and even then, uh, up to that point in time, they did not have an understanding concerning inheritance given to uh, daughters, right? 
who are orphans and who have no brothers. So, so they ask a very good legal or law question. Why should our father's name disappear? So you see, they're contending not for their own names, but they're contending for the name of their father. And not just one father, as love for had, but there's Hefer, there's Machir, there's Gilead, there's Manasseh, right? There's Joseph. So you can see that. Whose name are we contending for? But of course, our father's name, he is the rock, he is the fountain of living water, he is the he is love, he is justice, he is righteousness, he is Jesus. And then they ask a just request. Give us property among our father's relatives. So that's something real, all right? Give us a legal deed of a property among our father's relatives. So we want to keep our father's name. Very powerful. So we hear that honest confession, our father did die in the wilderness, but the bold testament that he did die, but he did not die like Korah and the followers who were rebellious and challenging God. But he died for his own sins. And then a good question, should our father's name disappear? Just because he did not have a son, you didn't give him a, God didn't give him a son, but give him five daughters, here we are. And then they had this just request, the righteous request, give us property, give us that land deed, which is going to put us and our father's name within the clans of our fathers. Now we go to Hebrews chapter 4 now and reading from verse 9. There remains a Sabbath rest, a Sabbathismos, for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us make every effort to enter that rest. So to enter into that rest, into that rest where their father's memorial is going to be established within the clans of their ancestral fathers, these young girls had to contend, had to make every effort and so they came before Moses and the elders of the of Israel and to the very place where the community meet before God at the entrance to the tent of meeting of God. So let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. No one perishing by following the example of disobedience. Who perish? Korah and others who were rebellious. They perished because of their disobedience. Verse 12, for the word of God is alive and active, or you can say the covenant of God, the covenant promises of God is still alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So whether we like it or not, God's words continue to be around us, over us, and in us, and examining us. All right? So it's just like you're going through the, the most powerful scanners in the world, whether in the hospital or the airport, and you're being scanned. Right? And he knows every part of your thoughts. So all of creation, verse 13, Hebrews 4, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So let's better give the good accounting like these daughters of the love for had. They gave the good accounting through their honest confession, their bold testament, their good questions, and their just request. And that's what we can and should do. Because by doing that, carrying the testimony of Jesus, that includes testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, it includes standing in the temple courts and discussing the Bible, all of scriptures with the greatest theologians of his day. That's part of who we are and what we are. And some of you are getting it in a very, very big way. I'm, I'm so thankful and heaven is so thankful and proud of you. you. You understand why week after week and during the week, some of you interact with me as well, many hours, right? Why do we do that? Because we are 
coming together uh, to contend and to understand the ways of God are just and righteous altogether. And we are learning how to come into uh, this place where we can give an account before the judgment seat of Christ that, Lord, we have made the good confession. We have made the bold testimonies and asked the, the good questions as, as good students and as good sons and daughters. We are now believing in our inheritance and our right, and we are not going to surrender it away, not going to squander it away, not going to be stolen away by others. You and I, we are called uh, as a kingdom of king priests. Don't be afraid of using the word priesthood or kingship. Don't try to play politics or play uh, what is politically sounding right or what. Yeah, it's uncomfortable in the ears of even the church. If you say, oh, you are a priest. Oh, 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 I don't like it. Is that so? Then you have no business in the covenant because we are called into that. All right. So start thinking like a priest, and then you can function like a king. Yeah, are you a king? You you better say, yes, I am a king in the making. I'm going to take one of the thrones with the Lord Jesus. Even though I may not have been able to, to be exemplary in every way, right? But I'm going to be exemplary in many, many ways, and one more way, and one more way, and one more way, all right? Let's go on to the third aspect, which is the anagogical sense, the anagogue, all right? The anagogue or anagogy, the noun. So here is where scripture carries, implies or foretells of something very, very eternal in importance. So all scripture, when you read it from an anagogical sense, uh, you are looking at towards fulfilling your God destiny, fulfilling divine destiny, right? So, so you're not just doing your 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 work at an office desk, right? There is more than that. You're not just serving a few customers or a hundred customers at at you know in your shift at the Safeway checkout. You're not just somebody who is washing cars in India or Africa or in Singapore for, so that the, the bosses and the people, high executives who come down to their car, they see a shining car. You are serving, if you are a Christian, as a king, right? There is a divine a purpose. You are remembering the scripture. The one who is the greatest is the greatest servant of all, right? The one who's going to be great knows the word of God and does not set Minimize any parts of the word of God, Jesus says in John 5, right? So they pay attention to scripture, then you can be great. And so when you pay attention to scripture, whether you read the Bible or listen to the Bible or you think the Bible, because you pay attention, you can be great. So there is an eternal significance. So let's go to the anagogical sense. And uh, so the next, uh, you can say five or six verses, or six verses from verse five, uh, Numbers 27. So Moses brought their case before Yahweh, I am, and I am said. And here he pronounced a favorable divine decision. Just so you, you go to the judge, right? And he pronounced a favorable decision, right? And he said, what Zelophehad's daughters said is right. They're right on. Can you imagine five young girls brought out a legal question and the God who gives all laws and statutes said that these girls are right. We need to talk about this. And then he gives the divine judgment. So from the decision that they are right, now he gives his decision, the divine judgment. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. Wow. That's a judgment. And then comes the divine precedence, a set of laws that's going to become the standards from which 
this particular situation of often daughters and with no brothers, they have this legal rights. So the, le the divine precedence, the God legal precedence from verse 8 to 10. And it says here, or rather verse 8 to 11, it says, say to the Israelites, if a man dies and leaves no son, give his inheritance to his daughter. If no daughter, give his inheritance to his brothers. If no brothers, give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father had no brothers, give his inheritance to the nearest relative in his clan that he may possess it. Wow. Because of the boldness of these young daughters of the love ahead, God is not is obligated and he he actually outlined these precedents. So this is if a man dies and has no son, but he has daughters or one daughter, give that inheritance to that daughter. That's powerful. That's powerful. Now, but if he has no daughter, give his inheritance to the father's brothers. So we are talking about the paternal uncle, right? So the Zelophehad's brothers. So if the Zelophehad did not have any children at all, or no, daughter, no son and not even a daughter to give, then give it to his brothers, the Lofa has brothers. However, if he had no brothers, then give it what? Give it to his father's brothers. So, so not only to, if the father has no, no brothers, then have to give to the Lofa has fathers, Hefa, and Hef, the brothers of Hefa, so up the line, so grand uncles from the paternal line. And if no more, you can find that, then give it to the nearest relative. All right, wonderful. Now, the very last verse in this passage says, this shall be a statute of law for the Israelites as Yahweh had commanded Moses. So you say, stem into law by decree of heaven. So powerful. Now, let's read the uh, passage through the lenses of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Now we are thinking the, the eternal, you know, non-ending time kind of a sense, right? So Hebrews 4, 14. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. God is able to empathize with the struggles, the weaknesses, the concerns of these five orphan daughters. So the Hebrew author tells us we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Wow, uh, powerful. Now we bring Jesus into the equation, and, and Jesus shares as God the struggles and the weaknesses and the failures of men and falling into sin, not being able to give God the glory due to his name. But Jesus did not fail in that. Jesus gave God the glory. From the age of 12, which is the legal age from the uh, Jewish biblical mindset where they are accountable before God. So maybe Jesus did a few naughty things when he was younger. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. That's not sin, right? When kids sometimes do a little bit. Sometimes we, we, sometimes we laugh at the little, what we call, they, they, they try to help you to pour the, the, the milk and then they ended up pouring the milk all over and then breaking the whole jar in their glass and all that. All right, yeah, it's a sin of the world, sin of the imperfection in a way, but that's not a personal sin of that kid, right? So let's, let's, let's grow up in our understanding of looking at how God looks at things. And uh, so, so that, you can say, 
that breaking of the glass, pouring of milk, becomes a powerful uh, moment in which the child learns about the condition of sin, of things are not perfect, uh, things are incomplete. And so the child can be taught how to deal with that situation by cleaning it up and by accepting that there are certain losses that are okay, you know. But the, more importantly, we are learning some very, very much more precious lessons like, okay, yeah, it's good that you learn how to want to pour the jug of milk into the glass, uh, but we've got to do it a few more times, right? you got to gain a bit more strength in your arm and you got to get gain more dexterity. Uh, so we'll work on it. All right, let's do that. And as we're pouring our milk into the glass, what about pouring of uh, books into your head, right? So we use those moments uh, as points of learning. All right, back to the... Hebrew 4, and picking up from verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So in other words, we must boldly come because God, even his instructions to do good and don't do the bad things, we must come to comfort, with confidence to the instructions of God, right? And Maybe the instruction is a bit difficult. Maybe the teacher wants me to write this Chinese character uh, called righteousness in the traditional form, which is like a, a lamb that has his feet cut off and sitting on a me, and very difficult to write. And he wants me to write a hundred times. I can't even write one time very, you know. So, but anyway, come with confidence for help. Say, okay, help me to write out this word righteousness. All right. Uh, one time, maybe you, you have to put your hand over my hand. And that's what my teachers have done before. You know, my Chinese teachers literally have grabbed my hand or some other have said, OK, this. And I have done that with my children. OK, let me show you how to trace this out. You have done that yourself. Right. So it's OK. We can come confidently and learn because God gives these sets of laws for your inheritance. You're inheriting the knowledge. You're inheriting an education. You're inheriting the mind of a priestly king. Now, this is not the end because we uh, we have more precedent. So pick up the main narrative from Numbers 36. It continues with um, uh, what he called with another aspect of this of clans of Joseph, right? And uh, so, so this is this is as a result of the laws, the precedents given to uh, to address the daughters of Zelophehad's legal plea. It creates creates another set of problems for the clans. <laughs> All right, that's very interesting. So, family heads, Numbers thirty six of the clan of Gilead. Right, and they, they go through that and it says, when Yahweh commanded, they came to Moses saying, when Yahweh commanded our land inheritance to Israel by Lot, he assigned our brothers, the, the Lophaheads, inheritance to his daughters. Now, what if these daughters of the Lophahed, who have these assigned lands from our ancestral family line, what if they were to marry into other tribes? And because of other laws like the year of Jubilee, a 50th year, whatever. And so even if it's temporarily, the, the land is controlled by us right now because the daughters have indentured their land to us uh, of the tribe. You know, these daughters maybe have, have leased their land back to their own tribal members. But when they get married to a for another tribe of Israel, at the year of Jubilee, the land has to go back to its rightful owner. So, so the daughters now are married into another tribe. So lawfully, they have belong to another tribe. So even though they have leased the land to us, who are of the tribe under this ancestral line of the Lophahet and Hefer and Machir and, uh, and uh, Gilead and Manasseh and so forth. Now, what will happen? So God gave another set of divine precedence, you can say addendum <laughs> or whatever, addenda. But can you imagine he gave another favorable divine decision here? So Yahweh's word came to Moses, to the Israelites, what the tribal descendants of Joseph said is right. Just as he said, what the daughters of the uh, Zelophehad had said is, is right. Now he's saying what these ones, 
the uncles, the grand uncles, the cousin, boy cousins uh, of of these daughters of the lawful head say is also right. And so now he gave the requirement that no inheritance in Israel is to pass from one tribe to another. So, so Yahweh, the great I am, said this as a command to the lawful head's daughters. So that's why I said that they were not married yet, right? Because the command from the lawful head, uh, from God, in Numbers 36, verse 6, to these daughters of Zelophehad is this. So Zelophehad's daughters may marry anyone they please, but only within their father's tribe, father's tribal clan, because no inheritance in Israel is to pass from one tribe to another, for every Israelite shall keep the tribal inheritance of their ancestors. Every daughter who inherits land in any Israelite tribe must marry someone in her father's tribal clan so that every Israelite will possess the inheritance of their ancestors. No inheritance may pass from one tribe to another for each tri Israelite tribe is to keep the land it inherits. Verse 10, so Zelophehad's daughters did as Yahweh commanded Moses. Mala Terza, Hogla, Milka, and Noah married their cousins on their father's side. They married within the clans of the descendants of Manasseh, son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in their father's tribe and clan. Beautiful, right? Now, there's a lot more we can develop uh, to bring it into modern context from these lessons, but we won't do it here. So some of you... You know, you want to do it with me privately, whatever we can. Uh, we can go into great details of the implications and why and wherefores. But uh, for our purpose, this is what we want. Well, one more point that I need to address before we uh, conclude to this message. Sorry. It's because today it didn't allow me to. Oh, yeah. Now it allowed me to. Okay. Yeah. So finally, we want to. Uh, kind of round it up into this covenant succession, the idea, because Joshua 17, uh, it's a very important chapter. Now, the book of Joshua brings us to a place where the tribes finally have come into the land and they are conquering the parts of the land that can be now allotted, given to different families, including to the family group under the tribe of Joseph through Manasseh. Right, Manasseh is the oldest son, Ephraim is the youngest son. And Manasseh, uh, he has allotments in this land of uh, uh, Gilead here. Right, so and, uh, so we, we read in Joshua 17 verse 1, this was the allotment for the tribe of Manasseh as Joseph's firstborn son. Now, in Numbers 27, we are looking at the what we call family heritage of Zelophehad's family, so the daughters. Here we are looking at the heritage of this entire clan, right? That came out of, or clans that came out of Manasseh. So it's a tribal thing rather than just an individual family, uh, uh, kind of a covenant succession and inheritance. And so verse 2 says, so this allotment was for the rest of the descendants of Manasseh, the clans of Abizah, Hilak, Ashriel, Shechem, Hefer, and Shemida. These are the other male descendants of the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. Verse 3, Zelophehad, son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Malkir, son of Manasseh, had no sons but only daughters, Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Terza. Verse 4, they approached, these daughters now, they are in the promised land, they approach Eliezer the priest, Joshua son of Nun, who stands like a king, like Moses stood like a king, and the leaders and said, Yahweh commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. So they never forget now that you become a Christian and you are told to be a Christian, you, you can be a son of God. And now that you are a Christian, now you, you have to stake your claim. You have to come to God. Now that I have been a Christian, Father, 
you know that I need my inheritance as a son of God, as a real king. All right. And so you teach me how to and give me a portion to me. So within my territory, within my life as a house homemaker. All right. How can I come into my inheritance? Right. How can I own the kingship within this circum small piece of land? This uh, enrichment, I think, stand a lot at some places were uh, 40 white by 100. So quite close to Vancouver's. But so give me and some of the municipalities, they have even divided into half of that. So instead of three to four thousand square feet of land per private property, they divide it into half. So you maybe have two thousand and that's still very good. Very, very good. And 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 so that is your inheritance. So it doesn't matter where your inheritance. Can you imagine you have you have just half a Vancouver lot in the most expensive part in Vancouver in the Shaughnessy area? Uh, that was to be many more times worth than a lot many times bigger. So even if your small lot of your life seems to be very tiny compared to others, but in God's accounting, you are in the best of lands, best of inheritances. So even your housewife or homemaker or just, you know, whatever other work that you do, all right, carry so much more. Because you are working out your vocation, vocationally in that capacity as a son of God who is going to sit on the throne. Right? Okay, so let's go on. Joshua 17, verse uh, 4 to continue. So Joshua gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers as was commanded by Yahweh. Thus, 10 shares, 10 lots, Ten Hevel, the Hebrew word, ten lots fell to Manasseh. You see, he's talking about the tribal, the inheritance going back to Manasseh, the one that Yahweh has not forgotten because the name has the idea of cost of causing to or forgotten the sorrows of the past or whatever it is. So, you know, so God remembers. So, in addition to the land of Gilead and Bashan beyond the Jordan. Right? They are given these 10 shares. So they have two more lots because uh, they re because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance among his sons. Right? And the land of Gilead belonged to the rest of the sons of Manasseh. And if you read on there, kind of 12 lots, it seems, in all. But 10 shares fell to Manasseh. And so what are those 10 shares? Look earlier in verse 2, right? The allotment was for the rest of the descendants of Manasseh. These were focusing on the rest of the Manassehs. The other two, the other parts of the family, they have the larger piece of Big Gilead and, and, and some of the territories, Bashan, that area, right? So we are now focusing on just this sub line which produces the clan specifically in this line. So, so you can say that the six sons of Gilead got 10 lots, right? So these are the six sons of Gilead, Abiezer, Helek, Ezreal, uh, Shechem, Hefer, and Hamida. And one of the sons, the, you, can, the, you can see the sixth son, Hefer, the son of Gilead, because he has no sons, and so daughters, and there are five daughters, so five of these lots were given to them, and five of the other lots were given to these other sons of Gilead. Wow, this is almost like a great disproportion. It seems that these daughters of the sixth son, Hefer, <laughs> get just as much as these five other uh, legitimate, you know, sons uh, in the family clan line. So this is one of those places where it's so beautifully done that God is privileging and showing us how women are priceless. Women in his kingdom are priceless. Uh, but because when we come into the, the real world events around the world and women who are who had to, you know to be given dowry, and sometimes the dowry is given uh, by the, the bride to the other families, reversing the biblical model and cr causing great hardship. So all kinds of hardship and, and problems in the in the world out there. But as far as God's family is concerned, God's covenant succession is concerned. 
Uh, women are just as special and in some cases are even more honored than the men. All right, let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you once again that your word allows us to uh, continually enter into your spirit. And today we have covered uh, uh, the life journey and lessons uh, from the daughters of the love ahead. And some of it may be a bit technical and challenging, but I pray that everyone who listens to uh, this uh, words of scriptures and the meditations around it uh, would be given more and more illumination of what you are revealing. We thank you that you have all of us in your heart, whether we are male or female, or whether we are orphans. Lord, we thank you because you are a God uh, who has an allotment for each one of us, each one of us. And I pray for all of us in in your family, starting with the Jam family and into all the families, the clans of Jesus, our line of the tribe of Judah, that we uh, will uh, we will be bold and we will be wise and we will be persistent uh, in pursuing our real heritage, just like the daughters of the Lofa had and just like the council given to us in the book of Hebrews and in so much of our apostolic teaching in the Bible. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Continue to uh, help us and bless us uh, to not draw back. And we pray uh, that, that we will grow in, sh in the knowledge and in the grace of you, Lord Jesus, day by day. For your name's sake, for the glory of the Father. Amen. The Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance before you as you come to him, come to meet with him at his tent, as you come and stand before him to, to, to ask good questions, to make that bold testimony and to make that, that humble, true confession and to ask for your inheritance. It is eternal for his name's sake, to perpetuate his name in your lives, in our lives together. Amen.